Okay, so in the previous, um, done this course in general, I've, it's had a heavy focus on the um, sort of practical side, learning how to actually build websites, you know, the front end with the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and the back end with the PHP and the JavaScript, and the databases, MongoDB, some of the database. So the core technologies has been the main focus of this uh, course. Now in this lecture, um, I want to sort of expand that a little bit and give you some sort of some of the more conceptual sort of uh, more kind of knowledge based stuff about the technology sort of about the context within which the sort of work you've done on this course has is will t takes place in the real world so I've called it commercial websites and I just want to explain you know how come how the sort of internet and the world wide web work say a little bit about servers sort of how you can run your own servers how commercial servers work Web caching is a very important part of commercial websites. And things like search engine optimization, website analytics, website APIs. These are all sort of features of, of modern commercial websites. And, you know, if you ever move into the larger scale e-commerce website area, then all of this stuff will become highly relevant. So this, so first part I want to talk, I want to distinguish between the internet and the World Wide Web. Now it's commonly confused, I do it myself all the time, but it's worth being clear on what the actual difference is, and then if you mess them up in ordinary speech, then that doesn't really matter so much. But it's important to be clear about what we mean by the internet, what we mean by the World Wide Web. So the internet refers to the publicly accessible series of interconnected computer networks, linked by copper wires, fiber optic cables, so on and so forth, uses packet switching, and typically uses the standard internet protocol, RIP, and probably maybe TCP as well. So the internet is a sort of infrastructure and some protocols that make all that infrastructure work and let computers talk to each other and so on and so forth. Now the World Wide Web sits on top of the internet and is a series of interlink interlinked hypertext documents accessed via the internet. So contingently, the World Wide Web happens to use the internet, but it could also use any other methods of sending the data around. So historically, the two have been closely linked, but there is actually a very clear separation between the two. So this is a visualization of the internet, all the wires, cables, you know, fiber optic cables, stuff, and all the rest of it. Um, and then here we have the World Wide Web, which is a set of documents linked together. The World Wide Web's kind of uh, dependent on the domain name system, um, and it has its own protocol, the HTTP protocol, to hook it all together. Now the internet is a packet switch network. Packet switch network work um, by taking the data, breaking it up into chunks called packets. Each packet has a header, and I'll explain some of the protocols that work at different levels. And these packets are sort of rooted over a shared network, and each packet has its own kind of address. Um, and so they're just sort of chucked into the internet. They work their way through, um, and they find their way to the destination. Um, there's no like dedicated path. So when you're talking to someone on the phone, you know, back in the day, you used to have like a dedicated sort of uh, connection, if you like, between one phone and another, using all these kind of relays and stuff. But with a packet switch network, it's different. You're just sort of chucking it into the, in, into the internet, and the routers are kind of smart enough to know roughly where to send your uh, packet to its destination. Uh, yep. So each packet is treated separate entity, has enough data to get it to the recipient, and the intermediate nodes don't necessarily know about the final destination of the packet, but they know enough about uh, you know, how things work so that they can move that packet closer to its destination. Um, so they move it to another intermediate node, it moves it again a bit closer until it gets you know, close enough so that it can be put, uh, directed to the exact place where it needs to go. There's no pre-established route. Um, intermediate nodes, known as routers, they don't need to sort of figure out the route in advance. It's just a sort of a rough kind of heuristic kind of network. So a rough analogy, which may be useful, is thinking about um, how you might send a book using a series of postcards. So a book is a big kind of chunk of data. Now, I suppose I've got a friend in, I don't know, Moscow, let's say, and I want to send you know, a copy of Pride and Prejudice to this friend in Moscow. And it so happens um, that I have a large number of postcards and stamps, all perfectly suitable for sending uh, small bits of data um, to Moscow. So what I can do is I can take that book, I can chop it up into chunks, and each chunk I can have assign a particular number to it. So the first part of the first page will be good one, second part of the first page I'll call two, and so on through the book. So they have numbered chunks of text. And each of these chunks of text I'll copy into my postcard. Um, and 
along with the number saying, so I can order them when the, my friend can order them when he receives them. And then I'll put the address of my friend on each of the postcards. So my postcard will have the chunk of text, the, the number, the sequence number of the chunks, and it will have the address of my friend. So I have an enormous stack of postcards, if I'm talking, I can't remember what I said, Pride and Prejudice, something like that. Enormous stack of postcards containing all of this data, and I just bung them in the post. Now, when it gets to the sorting office, the sorting office won't you know, know much about Moscow, right? They won't know the street names in Moscow. They won't take each of those postcards individually to Moscow, right, in the right order. What they'll do is they'll know that the Moscow sorting office will have a much better idea about how to find the destination. So they'll take the postcards and they'll send them on to the Moscow sorting office. Now, some of these postcards might go by ship, some of these postcards might go by plane, some might go by boat. And so they'll all get there on different timescales and in a completely jumbled up order. They'll get, you know, through, they'll pass through the Moscow sorting office. That will pass them to, you know, the person who delivers the postcards and he'll know exactly where the street is. So you can see you've got the intermediate nodes. We're just moving those postcards closer to the destination until they get delivered to the exact address of my friend in his flat. When my friend gets these postcards, you know, I'll probably have to wait for all of them, and then he can use the sequence numbers to reassemble the, piece, the complete book um, as long as he's got all the postcards, as long as it's a reliable uh, messaging system. So I said, so that's the rough postcard analogy, and the internet works in a very similar way with these kind of datagrams. So to make all this work, um, we have to carefully uh, define the format of the packet. So in the postcard analogy, I had to have my sequence number, and I needed to know that this is a chunk of a book, and I needed to have the address, which has its own sort of you know, name, street, flat, or whatever, uh, city, postcode, and so on and so forth. Same is true of the protocol, protocols used for the internet. And so the definition of the format of the packages is known as a protocol. And I don't think you've come across this in previous courses, and that's why I'm going to throw it in now. This, and you have this idea of the open systems interconnection model. And this defines the different protocols that are used at different levels of the internet and how they kind of work together. That's what I'm going to briefly explain now. So suppose we've got some application data. In my postcard example, that was the chunks of the book, but this could be um, some HTML, it could be some JSON, it could be any kind of stuff like that. And I want to send this application data um, to another application, right? So in this case, um, maybe I want to send it, maybe suppose I want to uh, post some data from a form um, to a web server. So then I might use FTP, SMTP, SM, SNMP, or HTTP. So this is an HTTP, is an application protocol um, that works, that makes the World Wide Web work, right? I've talked about this in a previous, in the AJAX lecture, right? It's a way in which we can control the format of packages um, that's sent between clients and servers, web browsers typically, and web servers, right? It generally uses TCP IP to send the messages, but that's not essential. So here for the client, it sends the HTTP message, which has the very kind of carefully defined format with, you know, the, the method, the destination, a few bits and bobs, and then the actual data coming back, you know, um, inside the, the body of the message. So that's the HTTP protocol. The HTTP protocol could be sent, you know, I can just write that on a postcard, right? I could communicate with my friend in Moscow using HTTP um, by writing this stuff and sending it to him and then getting back a response. But contingently, um, it's much easier running HTTP on top of the transport layer because that'll just send it across, you know, electronically and it'll get there in like less than a millisecond or whatever. So what we usually do is we have a, something we want to send at the application layer level and then we, and that has its own header, as I explained, the HTTP has its own header here. And what we do is we wrap that up in another protocol, in this case, the transport layer protocol. And to do that, we need to stick another header at the end of it. So TCP is a transport layer protocol, and, what, and that um, is used for port-to-port -port communication. So each computer, I think got ports, yeah. Um, it's reliable, TCP, so you've got the difference between TCP and UDP, which we'll come across. TCP is reliable, it has ways of error checking the messages and so on and so forth. You can work with streams, um, so it's suitable for things like file transfer, email, so on and so forth. So it's accurate rather than timely, so TCP can be a bit laggy if you're using it for games or something like that. So TCP sends uh, a packet from one port on one computer, uh, sorry, from one port um, to another port. It's a communication protocol between two ports. And a port is like an address on a specific computer. So each computer has between no, uh, ports, and the port numbers range from 0 to 65535. And it has like these uh, reserved port numbers are for particular sort of 
clearly defined services, like port 80 is used, typically used for HTTP. Sorry about the flicker there. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what I can do about that. Maybe that will help. So there's certain port numbers that are reserved, um, you know, for you know, particular services, this kind of stuff. And the rest of them, it's a bit free and easy. So for example, MongoDB runs on port 27,000 something. So I said, many services are listed on specific ports. So like MongoDB, I gave an example. HTTP typically runs on 80 or 8080, um, databases and so on. So ports and address on a specific machine. And we use TCP to send data from one port to another port. And so we have, this is the, the sort of format of the packet, the protocol. So the first sort of 16 bits are where the, where the data is coming from. And this is the port where it's going to, the source port number, destination port number. You've got a bunch of stuff to enable reliability. And then here's the data. And the data in this case is all of the stuff um, here. Um, this, all this application stuff, including the application header, is just chucked in here as the data in the TCP, in the TCP packet down here. The next thing is, so then sending between ports is all very well, um, but that's not going to help us get something across the internet because with the internet, we need to deal with, uh, we're dealing at the internet layer and we want to send things from one IP address to another IP address, not just between ports. In the internet layer, we have another protocol, the IP protocol, which transmits data between two IP addresses and these IP addresses can be located anywhere in the world. I'm sure you're aware of IP addresses. It's basically a way of locating a specific machine on the internet for the most part because you have like local networks and all the rest of it. Statically, dynamically allocated, a bit like a number, right? So if I call this number from anywhere in the world, I'll reach the International University of America, a place I used to work. Whereas if I type this IP address from anywhere in the world, I'll get to Google web's, uh, website. So the internet is based on IP addresses. As I said, you have this, you know, subnets and all the rest of it. But broadly speaking, it's a bit like a telephone number where you can reach anywhere else in the world. Or even telephone numbers, you get on local networks, right? You may be aware that, um, so this is like the IP version 4 internet address. Um, we're running out of these kinds of addresses, so they're switching over to IP version 6 gradually, slowly. So obviously you can store a lot more data because there's a lot more, lot more numbers in an IP version 6 address. So the IP uh, header is the same kind of thing. So again, same idea. We've got our transport layer between ports, and we're going to wrap that entire message in, add another header on top, and put that to send it between two, two IP addresses. So let's find my protocol again. So here we go. We've got the source IP address, the destination IP address. Obviously, it's going to be a bit bigger for the IP version 6. And then a bunch of stuff that enables us to get it there reliably. And then we've got uh, the data, which is all the stuff I've just talked about before. So finally, so that's setting us things across between machines. But we've also got the local communication within like the Wi-Fi network, across the Ethernet cable, and so on and so forth. And this is the data link layer. And this enables us to communicate between re two real physical devices with fixed MAC addresses. So again, you may have cross, come across media access control addresses. Every single device on the internet has this unique address, the, media, the MAC address. And so even if you've got two different network cards on the same computer, they've got different MAC addresses. Generally stays fixed. You can kind of change the MAC address using some operating, on some operating systems. But the idea is that every single device in the entire world has this unique identifier. And this is, enables us to send data from my computer to my router, from my router to the next router, and so on and so forth. And you have like the Ethernet frame. So if I'm plugged into the Ethernet, um, then I've got you know an, another packet that wraps all the data that I've talked about so far. This is the payload here, and then it has like the destination MAC address and the source MAC address there. So then we can send it across to the next router, and then that can wrap it in a different, uh, diff put a different header on it to send it to the next router, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the that's the internet. Now I can talk about the World Wide Web. So, you know, famously began at the European Center for Nuclear Research, one of the few impacts, possibly, of uh, nuclear research, as a way of exchanging documents between a community of physicists connected by the internet. So the, the World Wide Web, distinct from the internet, is based on, a, based on the HTTP protocol, which works at the application layer, based on HTML for marking up documents. And most importantly, we've got the universal resource locators, URLs, um, that, um, which are supported by the domain name system. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. So you could run the World Wide Web um, using IP addresses, right? 
when I wanted to create a link between my website and another website, I could just type in the IP address of that other website. Um, but there's a lot of disadvantages to that. Um, let's just go into that. Okay, so supposing I typed in the IP address of put the so say I want to create a link to Google on my website. So I might have you know ahref equals and then put the IP address of Google and then you know um, that would be my website um, which was linking to Google. The problem with this is if I just use the IP addresses, um, IP addresses can change, right? I might Google might move its change its hosting provider. Google might you know. Uh, for some reason, best known to itself, uh, change its IP address. Uh, might use a caching system, which mean um, I, the IP address would be different. Might want to access it from the cache instead of accessing Google. For a variety of reasons, IP addresses are kind of lousy and also can't remember the wretched things. So to make the World Wide Web work, they have this idea of the domain name system that connects a human readable URL to an IP address. It's much easier to remember www.google.com than some random IP address. So the idea of the domain name system is that any computer in the world can type in a URL and then the DNS servers convert that URL onto an IP address and then the, your browser will actually use that IP address to request the documents um, from the web server. So the domain name system is mapping these domain names onto IP addresses and this is called host name resolution used for you know, most of the protocols to do with the World Wide Web. So if I want to send an email to david at example.com, I don't have to remember whatever IP address handles that uh, email sent to that address, the DNS server will map this onto a, a list of hosts that it will accept mail for that domain. So I said it's easier to remember IP um, names than IP addresses, easier to write links in HTML. If someone changes their web, hoster, their web host, um, then I don't have to update all the documents on my website. I can just keep the same, uh, as long as they keep the same domain name, all my links will continue to work. Um, you can also create a market for buying and selling domains. I don't know if that's much of an advantage. And obviously, you know, humans find it much easier to remember this stuff. And so it's much easier to type in Google than type in some IP address. So back in the day, um, all of the host names and addresses were stored in a single file. And you could just download that file. And then that file contained a mapping between a list of IP addresses and a list of uh, domain names. And so it could, you know, switch between the two. Today, to make it all work, because there's such a huge number of people using the, the World Wide Web, we have to have a very large distributed system to do all this for us. And they built this thing called the domain uh, DNS domain hierarchy. So you've probably heard of, uh, I mean, these, these are getting more complicated these days, but roughly speaking, you've got top level domains such as .com, .net, .org, so on. Then you've got second level domains that are might register to an individual or organization, so Google, Microsoft, David Gammers, whatever. And then you can add subdomains to that as well, which are typically managed more locally, either by company or by the web hosting company. It's roughly like this. You have this kind of root domain, the sort of root domain servers at the top of the internet, um, or top of the World Wide Web, I suppose. Anyway, top of the domain name system. And then below that, you've got the top level domains, second level domains, such as Microsoft. And then you've got subdomains, uh, such as Example. And then you've got the actual uh, host. And roughly speaking, um, your computer is a DNS client. Um, your operating system probably handles this kind of stuff. And when you type in, you know, uh, Microsoft example.microsoft.com, your client will then connect, contact the DNS server. It will do the lookup and then reply um, with the IP address um, that the client needs to, to access that particular website. Now, there's a little bit of a sort of hierarchy here. So your DNS client it will be configured with a preferred DNS server by the internet service provider. And so there's a sort of process in which, firstly, the DNS client will have some kind of cached. Uh, it'll cache um, the, the most recent records that it's looked up already. To save time, rather than running its way through all the domain name system, it's going to store some of the recent results, figuring that, well, Google's not going to change its IP address that, that often. Then if it can't find it in its local cache, um, it will then contact the preferred DNS server. Again, this will have a cache, but if this can't answer the question, um, then it'll have this kind of what's called sort of iterative slash recursive lookup, where it'll contact the root server. The root server will say, well, hey, suppose we're looking up example.microsoft.com. It'll say, well, hey, I don't know anything about that. I don't know. I don't have the IP address, but hey, um, there's the, look, here's the com DNS server. Why don't you ask that com DNS server? The com DNS server will say, hey, I don't know where, I don't have the full IP address, but why don't you contact the microsoft.com DNS server? So they have like links between the servers that enable the servers to pass the request 
uh, on. So this server then tries that, tries that one, tries that one until it finds the one that it really needs, and then it returns the results to the user. All of this process is overseen by ICANN. It's not for profit organization, and it basically you know, manages the, you know, the unique identifiers on the internet, such as IP addresses, domain names, and so on. Um, credits people who register domains and oversees top level domains, root domains and root name servers, and coordinates the allocation of IP addresses. So these are sort of, you know, the people who make all this happen by coordinating it together. So if you want to register a domain name, which you may have done already, what you want, what you're saying is that I want a particular mapping between this human readable URL and an IP address. And, then I, and to make that happen, you have to propagate that mapping throughout the domain name system. As I said, there's lots of machines working together to make all this happening and make all this happen. And there's a lot of caching at different points of the system to make it as fast as possible. So when you've defined that mapping, the domain name system will eventually you know, update all its records so that when someone types a URL into the browser, the DNS system will return the IP address of your server somewhere on the internet, and then they can uh, view your website. And as I said, there's a lot of caching operating at different levels of the system, um, so it can take time for DNS changes to be globally visible. It used to be one to two days. I don't know what it is now. Um, so you know, don't be surprised if when you register a domain name, that it takes a little while for, you, for it to actually work across the entire internet. Now, this all sounds like you know, sort of super mega kind of corporate stuff or whatever, but actually you're perfectly free to set up your own DNS server at home. Um, and then you can just configure your uh, internet connection um, to use the DNS server that you've set up on your own network. And it, all this DNS server will do is it resolve map between the URLs and IP addresses for you. And if it's the preferred one, then that's the first computer or server that your uh, computer will contact. And it, it, if it can't resolve it, it can then pass it on to the more general uh, DNS servers. So there's various free ones out there. So you might, the, a typical application of this um, was in a company where you might want to resolve certain kind of key terms like accounts or, you know, IT or something as sort of names, resolve them to particular machines or particular parts of the company. So you might want to manage your own internal domain names um, that are independent of the ones on the, on the World Wide Web. So um, what you're doing with the domain name system is, is defining your URL, your uniform resource locator. And there's different types of these, which depend on the protocol that's being used. So you, know, you probably come across FTP protocol, or HTTP protocol, or mail to, or email protocol. So I'll just say a little bit very quickly about you know, what, this, what this string of stuff actually means with a URL. So the first part of the URL contains the protocol. So this could be HTTP, could be WebSockets, could be FTP, so on and so forth. Then you have a subdomain. So people typically think uh, that www stands for the World Wide Web. Well, it kind of does and it kind of doesn't. It's just a sort of default subdomain that most, um, most sort of host, web host or you know, uh, host um, domain name registration people sort of set up such that when you do www.google.com, it'll have some kind of default behavior and direct you to a public HTML folder. But there's no necessity to, uh, for this to be the default subdomain, or you can use different subdomains, it is just a subdomain. There's nothing sort of special or clever about it. So you know, if you use Google Mail, um, then you know the sub they use the subdomain mail.google.com, and I've registered different subdomains different times for different purposes. Um, you can so you can usually do it in the control panel of the web hosting company or the domain registration company, and point to different folders or web locations. So if you want to run you know, subdomain for, you know, uh, this course, for example, I could, I could easily have set one up and used that to point to a different website. So, you know, when I was teaching at International University of America, I had created a subdomain and put my course up there. And then we have the domain name, the kind of stuff you register and own and can sell and so on and so forth. Then you might have something like slash and then search. So on a small scale website, this will be usually be maybe a subfolder. So you might have a public HTML folder containing a bunch of subfolders. One of these might be called search. On a bigger scale website, you're probably going to set up mappings between Apache can have rules that map between you know, different uh, endings, different sort of uh, paths, so they're called, and different folders or different scripts or different servers or whatever. So in a more sophisticated website, you might use this to direct the request to a certain place. And then we talked about this query string um, in the previous lecture. You know, it's just a way of sending some data uh, using GET, typically, um, to the server. 
this query string, you know, cover that in a lot of detail as well. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a sort of bigger picture picture about you know the internet, the World Wide Web, um, within which your the bigger picture within which your e-commerce website and other websites operate. Let's say a little bit about servers now. So a server is a slightly ambiguous term because it sometimes refers to a program such as Apache that listens on a particular port. So if you'll run Apache now to run your PHP and the server processes the message and sends back a reply, that's the program. But then, so the program's called a server, but sometimes you call the computer that runs the program a server. Because if you have a dedicated computer running a server program, running Apache, then obviously that's doing the same task as, it's kind of doing the same thing, if you see what I mean. So sometimes it refers to the program, sometimes it refers to the computer. Now you can set up your own HTTP server at home. Um, you could actually register, well you can't register your, the, you can't do a register your, I'll, I'll explain why this is a little bit complicated. Um, but you can certainly set up your own HTTP server at home. You can set up, we've already showed you how you can run a, uh, Apache um, so that you can contact it using localhost and you can, can make your computer globally visible on the internet. Um, so if you set up your own server, you'd have a computer that runs Apache that listens on your IP address. It would have to be not on the local host, otherwise you won't be able to reach it. But the tricky thing with running a server from your house um, is, is how you can make your server's IP address visible on the internet. So the problem with setting up a server at home is that you typically have a private network um, with uh, sort of locally allocated IP addresses, and then it's only your router that has a publicly visible IP address. So, you know, all the computers on your subnet will be like 1 1.2, 192, 168, 185. That's the kind of local IP address, not the kind of IP address that you can reach from anywhere in the world. Can't reach my home machine by typing that into my browser at Middlesex. So home routers do have a globally valid IP address, and you can set up rules so that packets sent to this IP address um, will be forwarded to machines on your network. So if I send a packet to this IP address, I can actually you know, send a GET request to an uh, HTTP server running on my subnet within my home network. So you know, just to pick an example, so this is like you know, visualization of my home network. So here we have a public IP address. This is globally visible. Anyone, anywhere in the world can reach this router here. All of these machines here have these local addresses, right? So you can't actually reach these machines from the internet unless I've set up some kind of port forwarding rule from here. The trouble is, so that would all be fine. Um, the main problem is that this IP address can change and it can change at complete, in a way that's completely out of your control. It's allocated by the internet service provider. It can change whenever they feel like refreshing it and you have no idea when it will change. So I can't, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to register to put this IP IP address in my domain name record, right? Domain, to record this IP address in the domain name system because it's going to change and so it's going to be a bit of a mess and my website's going to be down and up all the time as this thing changes and I update my domain name record or whatever. Um, it's going to be all a bit tricky. There is a fix. Um, yeah. There's a fix um, and this is called Dynamic DNS. This is a service provided by a number of companies so, you know, I'm not promoting this one particularly. This is one I've used when I've been fiddling around with this stuff. And the idea is that the, this company has a record of my current IP address, and I register a subdomain with this company. So I've, in this case, got like David or david.ddns.net or whatever. And then if they want to reach my machine, they go to this, this address, and then for this address is then redirected um, to the address of my home router. That's how it works. And to make this work, we have a client on the home network or the home router itself can be configured to ping the company every you know, minute or so um, so that the company has an up-to-date record of my current IP address and then it can redirect any request that's sent to this um, to my home router. And the final stage of all this, um, which I haven't covered, is then you, then you need to set up some port forwarding from port 80 or something like that to wherever the, um, to the machine where the the HTTP servers running. Now, commercial companies, um, they have a publicly visible static IP address, so they don't have this problem. And they used to run their websites on these huge stacks of servers sitting in the company headquarters, and many of them still do, right? The problem with this approach, though, with commercial companies um, is this computer's fail, right? These things can fall over, fall over and die, burn up, fry, whatever. The, the building can burn to the ground. A lot of these servers used to be placed in basements, which got flooded. 
Um, so there's a whole ton of problems um, with maintaining these servers and dealing with problems when they fall, fall over. So at the very minimum, if you're a commercial company, you're going to have to have two separate premises and, and synchronize the data on, this, on the main servers with the backup servers that are on a different physical location. And these servers are expensive, right? So if you're you know, just doing your dot cart, your startup, uh, web startup company or whatever, um, you've got to set up all your servers, you've got to buy the servers, you've got to install and run them, you've got to troubleshoot problems of the hardware and software, ensure the integrity and backup of data. So typically you've got to hire a few people to actually do all this work, and it's going to be expensive. And it's going to be very difficult to plan how many servers you've got. As I said, you've got a startup company. Now, maybe in a year's time, you know, the company is going to be a bit lame. Maybe you've got 1,000 customers. On the other hand, maybe you've got a million customers in a year's time. So you've kind of got to guess how many servers you're going to need because you've got to get them up and running before the, before the demand hits you kind of thing. If you don't end up with enough, then your, then your website's going to be unreliable. It's not, people aren't going to be able to access it um, adequately. Or, if you, or you might end up with a whole pile of servers that you're just not using. Both of these, uh, both, if you don't accurately guess how much storage and server power you need, um, you're going to lose money. And this is one of the reasons, well, one of many reasons uh, why people are moving over to the cloud. So the idea of the cloud is that a company will just build warehouses filled with, you know, hundreds of thousands of servers called server farms. They'll stick these where land is cheap, where electricity is cheap, um, and they'll have just a small number of engineers. Um, who will configure the software, manage the backup, and so on. And then they'll hire out the servers or services um, to third parties. So if you've got you know, something like that, so the data center with 400,000 servers, you know, it's a, you know, massive things, these things. So, it's, so using the cloud has a lot of advantages, and that's why many, many companies are shifting to the cloud. Firstly, it's more flexible, right? Because you can easily increase in the amount you're using on the cloud and just pay more for it when you actually need it. You know, there's an economy of scale, right? So if you've got something like this, you know, the engineers who configure the software only have to configure the software for, you know, a few machines or make the whole thing work together, but they, you know, they don't have to individually configure, you know, 400,000 machines. They've got lots of mechanisms in place that will automatically deploy a single disk image across the entire server farm if they need to. So that all of the software stuff um, can be handled in a much more efficient way because you, you can have a much smaller number of engineers um, software people to kind of handle all the software there, and hardware people too. All the replication is done for you, right? If you're backing up to the cloud, you can be fairly confident um, that you know they're going to have this stuff synchronized with another physical location, or at the very least, some kind of elaborate backup mechanisms. Um, and often with versioning, so Amazon claims 99.99% availability, right? And there's economies of scales, right? So the cloud, you know, if you want to think about why people are moving to the cloud, you can think about why people move, use, um, you know, public, you know, uh, have large companies generate electricity for them. Suppose you wanted to generate your own electricity. You had a sort of slightly independent streak, um, and you thought, well, hey, I might be I'm going to generate my own electricity. So in this case, I'm going to have to estimate how much electricity I'm going to use, I'm actually using, have to buy the equipment, maintain the equipment, buy fuel, and so on and so forth. All of this... It's going to cost us a lot of money, a lot of time and effort. Whereas, you know, what we all do commonly is we have, you know, cloud electricity generation. So we pay someone else to build an enormous, you know, gas-fired nuclear power plant, whatever, somewhere where, it's, and they have professionals kind of managing that. And this thing generates a huge amount of electricity and then gets piped to us in our homes. And we can typically put this uh, power plant somewhere where land and electricity, land um, and labor are cheap. So cloud computing is the same way. We, instead of trying to micromanage you know, a bunch of servers in a rack in our company where, and doing all the work ourselves, we can just outsource that and just get the, the storage that we need and get the computer processing power that we need. And as long as the internet doesn't go down, um, we'll be all right. Obviously, there's limitations. If the server farm goes down or if the internet goes down, you're stuffed. It's hard to move data around because, you know, uh, the protocols and methods that you use to store your data on Amazon might be different from the ones you use for Microsoft, you know, cloud or something like that. And there's a bunch of issues about privacy, security, which I touched on, on uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, yeah, so different ways you can use the cloud. You can actually hire a virtual machine, in which case the virtual machine will be sort of time sliced on a real machine with other virtual machines. Um, so, and the virtual machine, you can kind of configure with whatever, whatever you want in there. You could, or you can hire a physical machine, or you can just add, um, 
Oh yeah, that's so Amazon EC2 is like you, you have like an elastic cloud computing instance, which is like a virtual machine, as I said, which can, and you can have multiple virtual machines running on a single figure, physical machine in a server farm. And you can back up the virtual machine and so on and so forth. You can also use the cloud for data storage. Um, so you can have like, a, you know, again, Amazon S3, DynamoDB, et cetera. These are data storage services in the cloud. So you have like a particular API that you use to sort of store some data, retrieve data. You can access the databases in the cloud. Uh, like that, and they'll have some kind of backup, replication, all that done for you. And you can also do data processing in the cloud. So if you want to generate recommendations from millions of customers or stream data from physical devices, then it's often cheaper to use cloud services to process that data for you. And the cloud data processing can be integrated with the cloud data storage. So Amazon has various tools for this. Elastic Map Produce being an example. Google has this fancy TensorFlow thing. So you can do this really big scale data processing, you know, and for a lot of projects, you only want the data processing for a short period of time, right? There's no point in buying a thousand machines if you only need you know, uh, a month's worth of data processing. It's much better to hire a thousand machines on the cloud for an hour, do what you need to do, and then you, know, then you don't have to get rid of the machines or find some, sell them or whatever. Right, next thing I want to talk about is caching. Um, and this is the problem that millions of users are accessing popular websites. So heaven knows how many people are hitting the BBC homepage every day. Um, and so we've got just a single web server, um, like on a home network, for example. Um, we can't possibly handle all of these requests. You know, you've got to access the database, you've got to process the PHP, and so on and so forth. So this is the sort of no caching situation. Here we have our clients somewhere in the, somewhere in the World Wide Web somewhere. It sends a GET request. We've got a PHP script here that fiddles about with the database. Get some data out of there, wraps it in HTML, and sends it back to the client. And this is the content management system doing roughly the same kind of thing. So obviously this takes time. The server's got to process the GET request, direct it to this script. The script's got to be executed. It's got to fiddle around, got to get the data out of the database. All this takes you know, a substantial number of milliseconds. And if you're trying to do that for 100,000 requests every second, um, a single server doesn't have a chance of managing it. So, well, so, when people, so if with certain types of page, um, you can dynamically generate the content once um, and then cache multiple copies of the page. So a good example of this is um, what they used to do at Trinity Mirror. So Trinity Mirror, you've got like a, it's a newspaper site, right? So you generate, so the page is, doesn't change much. It changes whenever there's a new bit of news, whenever there's a different advert, something like that. But roughly speaking, on a scale of tens of minutes, um, the newspaper website's not changing. So we can just generate the page once and put it into a caching software, and the caching software will deliver it very rapidly, the single page very rapidly to all of the customers. So this is what we got here. So here we have our client, sends the GET request, and, and that GET request is directed to the cache. So this could be one machine that has very fast like mem caching in memory or something like that, or it could be a whole network of machines that do caching. It doesn't really matter. And the cache will say, well, have I got this, this document, or is this document expired in my cache, in which case it delete it. If it hasn't got the document or it's only got an old copy, it will then send a request to the server, and it'll get the response, and then when it gets the response, it will store it in the cache and then reply and then send it back to the client. The next time the client needs the same, another client calls, uh, needs the same document, it will send the request. This time the cache will have the appropriate document and it will send it straight back without going through all the time-consuming stuff on the server. So we can have a relatively slow server um, and a very fast cache and with certain types of content, that's going to work very well because we're only requesting the page from the server you know, once every 10 minutes, let's say, which the server's perfectly happy with. And then we can you know, deliver very fast um, the document that's generated by the server to lots and lots of clients. Yeah. So that's a dodgy connection. And there's various bits of software that'll do you do this for you. So there's kind of software that you can run on your own network, such as Varnish and Squid. I think these are both free. And they've got Akamai, which is like a commercial uh, version of this. So Akamai is huge, right? You probably haven't heard of it, but it serves um, 15 to 30 percent of all web traffic. I think it's more than this now. I think it's gone to about 200,000 servers, something like that, and more than 100 countries. So an absolutely vast network of machines that's set up for commercial uh, web caching. It's called a content delivery network. So a lot of companies work, figure out different ways of delivering their content rapidly um, and close to the users. So it works a little bit like this. It uses the domain name system, which is the clever thing about Akamai. So the domain name system resolves a URL to an IP address. 
Now, with a small e-commerce website, it's going to resolve the URL um, to, the, to the main web server of the company, right? Um, but with Akamai, if, you're, if you've registered and set yourself up with Akamai, instead of resolving it to the customer's domain name, um, instead of resolving it to the IP address of the customer server, it's going to resolve it to the uh, IP address of the Akamai server. So if I type in bbc.co.uk or whatever, um, instead of directing me to the BBC server, London, Shepherd's Bush, whatever it is, it will redirect me to the Akamai server and I'll pull my content direct from the Akamai server. So it's using the DMS, DNS to direct the request to the Akamai caching system. So it selects the Akamai server based on content and locations. So it can be dynamic. And then the customer downloads the content directly from Akamai. So it's roughly like this. So this is called the origin server. This is the customer. The customers in this case are the big companies like BBC, Guardian newspaper, you know, Times newspaper, whatever, this kind of stuff. And then here we have the Akamai network, the 175,000, 200,000 machines. And here we have the edge servers that actually deliver the content to the customers. And here they have the end users, in this case, clients, people like you and me, looking at the BBC homepage, whatever. So the DNS system um, redirects the requests from here um, to one of the edge servers instead of to the origin server. So when I type in bbc.co.uk, it directs me to this web, this server, which would then deliver the content back to me. And this, con this these servers are distributed across the world so that they can be close to the customers and deliver that content very rapidly. And it's just like the other kind of caching, that if this server has the, has the up-to-date copy of the content, it delivers it straight to the end user. Otherwise, it requests it from the origin server. But again, you can see you're massively reducing the load on the or origin server. And I think... I think, uh, I think there's some clever ways in which this server can, the servers can exchange data between them as well. This kind of caching, or any kind of caching, is really straightforward with pages that don't change much, such as news stories, home pages of the BBC and all the rest of it. If you're dealing with content that changes all the time, like Gmail, you can't cache your email page, right, because it's changing all the time. You have to come up with other strategies for caching um, dynamic data. So Akamai has some clever algorithms that try to route uh, customer requests along the fastest route. So they have some ways of handling this kind of stuff, but it's obviously not as effective as just cloning a page and across millions, uh, across hundreds of thousands of servers. Okay, so next thing I want to cover is uh, search engine optimization. So when you're selling stuff, um, you want to appear first in the search results um, on Google, for example, or DuckDuckGoGo, if people are looking on that. Um, because when people are looking to buy stuff, some of them will just look through, you know, particular websites, Argos website, whatever. Whereas other people um, will maybe do a search on Google to try and find, you know, websites that sell that particular kind of product. And then typically, if you're not on the first page of the search results, you just don't exist, really. Most people don't go more than one or two pages down out of the hundreds of thousands of search results that Google returns. So let's suppose I'm selling cabbages, right? I've got my cabbage e-commerce website. When someone searches for cabbages for sale, you know, I want to be at the top of that list, right? So here I'm searching cabbages for sale. Now, there's different ways I can do that, right? I can, there's, you always have these kind of sponsored links, right? You have these kind of shopping links within Google. So you have to pay, for, to, be, you can pay to be a sponsored link at the top here. You can pay to be a link down here. But what would be ideal, right, is if I didn't pay a penny and that I always came up at the top of the list when someone searched for cabbages for sale, because then they say, hey ho, this isn't sponsored, this must be the real deal, the best cabbages, and so on and so forth. So that's the ideal, that's what I'd like. And to achieve that, um, we have to do some search engine optimization. And, and, to, and that w to, to do search engine optimization, you need to take into account the way in which a web crawler such as Google works. So you need to figure out how Google does this ranking, and then people try and game their websites so that they appear high in this ranking, that's the idea. So how does the, so Google has a large number of machines, and these machines are constantly uh, crawling the internet, um, loading all the different, loading different pages, following the links, and indexing all of the content on the webs, on the, on the World Wide Web. And then they're putting that into their enormous data structures, and they're using that cache, that, uh, the data, the stuff they're hoovering up from all the different websites um, in order to generate this ranking. So how do these web crawlers find the content? And what kind of content do they actually access? For example, do the Google web crawlers access uh, content in JavaScript? And what document types does it support? Is, Google, is the web crawler going to figure out what's inside a doc, 
document or a PDF, for example, or it can it only access HTML. So you need to know how the, the search engine's working in order to optimize your content so that you appear high in the rankings. Now, the original PageRank algorithm that made Google famous um, ranks websites according to the number of websites that link to them. Now, how relevant that is now, I don't know, you'd have to do your own research. There's lots of hidden, you know, behind the scenes strategies that Google uses. Um, and, but the, at the core of it, there may still be some page rank thing left. But just as an illustration of how these rankings algorithms work, I'll, I'll talk you through page rank a little bit. So the idea with page rank is um, you get a higher rank, you appear higher up the search re rank results, if uh, depending on the number of websites that link to you and the importance of the websites that link to you. Okay, so these are just ordinary Joe websites that no one's linking to, okay? And here we've got like a more important website for whatever reason um, that no one's linking to as well. Now, all of these websites are linking or pointing towards this website here. And by a sort of wisdom of crowds or whatever it is, you know, since all these websites think that this website's important, then we should maybe give this website a higher ranking. And so the size of these smiley faces corresponds to the importance of the website. Now, uh, this website here is linking to other, another website. And since this website here is being linked to by two fairly important websites and one medium important website, well, clearly, you know, these are important websites. So this must be an even more important website because these guys are linking to it. So that's the idea here, that the, the more websites that link to your website and the more important those links, um, the higher up in the ranking you appear. And obviously, there's also a lot of stuff on um, the content of your website. It's not merely, you know, if I'm searching for cabbages, it's not going to give me, like, you know, pictures of crowns, right? Um, and that's because, you know, Google and other web crawlers, you know, will do a careful look at, you know, there's other factors in this algorithm, such as, um, yeah, obviously the keywords on the, on the website, you know, what, 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 what's the content and how often it's been refreshed. Is it recent content and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff going into this. But in terms of stuff with equal content and equal freshness, um, then it's going to apply this kind of, uh, possibly apply this kind of ranking algorithm to decide which should come first. So if I create a, create a page all about, um, I don't know, uh, Brexit, let's say, um, my page of Brexit would be something like this. Um, but my Brexit page might link to the, you know, my local newspaper or whatever, and my local newspaper might link to the BBC, and I might link to the BBC as well, right? So in that case, you know, the BBC has obviously got more important information about Brexit than my humble page, even though we might have the same content, roughly speaking. So to get your site higher up the rankings, um, people do what's called search engine optimization. And there's a lot of legitimate techniques, and the search engines themselves recommend these techniques. One of these techniques is to make your site easy to be in, easy to in, easy to access, right? You've got programs, these web crawlers, that are working the way through your site, trying to find the different parts of your site. So if you create a sitemap, then these web crawlers can use that. I think you can create, um, there's ways of probably defining a sitemap that's web crawler friendly, and that enables the web crawler to find all of your pages, which would be a good start. Obviously, if I can persuade the BBC to provide a link to my site, that's going to help. Obviously, if I have fresh content, that might affect the algorithm as well. And obviously, if you've got, you need to apply uh, relevant keywords to site content and metadata. So how important metadata is these days, I don't know. You can put metadata tags listing the content of the site at the top of the page, but since everyone uses them to death, I doubt Google takes much notice of them, but who knows. Now, a lot of rather dubious companies um, have tried to kind of gain the search engine results um, by creating dummies. And this, these are what's called spam dexing strategies. So one spam dexing strategy is we create fake websites that link to my site. So if I create a lot of fake websites, I can make it appear that my website's important. And then there's like keyword stuffing. So if I want my website to have a, appear to be important, uh, source for cabbages. I can just put cabbages a million times in the HTML and, that, and people tried to use that to make it appear that their website was more relevant to a search term. Hidden text, so again, this is a way of hiding. So you don't want, if it, users looking at the website, they don't want to see a website with cabbages written a million times. So you might hide the, cabbage, the words that you're trying to stuff. You might hide the words that you're stuffing into your website by making them the same color as the background. People used to have doorway pages. Um, that were sort of very, you, you optimize um, a, where the sort of doorway, the front page of your website to be highly search engine optimized, but then it's actually kind of a lousy page probably. So then you have, um, that 
the user has to like click on that to get onto the real site, which maybe is less search engine optimized. And then, yeah, this is, you, if you can figure out whether it's a search engine, whether it's a web crawler or a human looking at your site, you can deliver a different page. So you can have a highly search engine optimized page delivered to the search engine and a different page to the human users. So these are the dodgy spam vaccine strategies you can use. I strongly recommend you don't employ them, firstly, because they probably no longer work. Secondly, because what used to happen is if you use these kind of things, use these kind of tricks, you can just kick to get kicked off the results for a long time. So I knew someone who had a nursery, uh, like growing plants, and they paid someone to do search engine optimization, and they just vanished off Google for ages. So you know you can really, you know, can really lose by trying this kind of stuff. So you can be penalised and end up being completely invisible. So a couple more things I want to go through briefly. Um, one of which is website analytics. So when you're building an e-commerce website. Um, you're spending a lot of money on it, right? You're paying people to develop it, you're paying for the servers, you're paying for the storage, all this kind of stuff. It's a ton of cash, and so it's really important that your website works and is effective with the customers. So you really want to know if you built it in the best way, right? Is it a user-friendly website? Um, are people, do people find it easy to make purchases on your, on your site? Are the adverts working well? Have you run an advert, uh, like an advertising campaign recently, like glossy ads in magazines? Has that increased uh, the traffic to your site and so on and so forth? So there's lots of reasons why um, you want to monitor what's going on with the website to, to ensure that you're actually, it's an effective, uh, effective tool for making money effectively. So we want to know how many people are using the site, uh, where, the, where these users are coming from, you know, what browser they're using, and the behavior on the site, right? You want to, you don't, you, the, the data that you get from an e-commerce website is what people actually buy, right? But you might also want to know, what's more important really, is what, when people don't buy. When they look at some of your goods, they read the product description, and then they decide, no, nah, I'm not going to buy that, I'm going to go to another website or whatever. You know, why are people dropping out of the sales process, okay? And in particular, we might need to use no geographical location because we might run an advertising campaign in Finland, let's say. So we might want to see, well, how, how has the web traffic changed since our massive advertising campaign in Finland? We might want to know, you know, if everyone's using Internet Explorer 1, uh, then we might have to make it a bit more browser friendly, make it a bit more friendly with that browser, and so on and so forth. Now, Google has this brilliant tool for, for analyzing uh, your web, the behavior of your website. You just bung a bit of uh, web tracking code into each page. Very easy if you're using server-side scripting. And this gives incredible data about what's going on in your website. You can drill down to you know, the different countries, the number of page views, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you can look at the behavior flow um, within the website to see who's dropping, out the who's dropping out at certain stages of the purchasing of stuff, and so on and so forth. If you set up your own website at home for some special interest thing, and you, know, you can gratify yourself by seeing how many people are looking at it, or maybe depress yourself, depending on how it's going. So you know, for a commercial point of view, this kind of stuff's absolutely essential. And often what companies will do is they'll try out a new design or something on a random selection of users or a random country or something. And then again, you can monitor whether your experiments in changing your design have actually improved this, the website. The final thing I want to cover is website APIs. So again, so far I've been talking about a single sort of e-commerce website that's you know, built by itself and exists by itself and blah, blah, blah. But actually, there's lots of relationships and interactions between different websites. And the simplest of which is kind of embedding, right? You can embed like Twitter feeds in another website, or images, videos, Facebook buttons, booking forms. It's a website I built for a hotel years ago. Um, I embedded, you know, booking form. There was like a third party that produced uh, the kind of had all the booking software um, with a separate sort of website. But I could embed the content from that other third party website in my own website so people could make bookings on the website. And with big commercial websites, um, you often have APIs or application programming inter interfaces um, that let people add content to their site. So sure, Amazon sells a lot of stuff, right? But a lot of what Amazon sells comes from third parties. And the same is true of eBay. And virtually all the content on Facebook comes from third parties as well. So with Amazon, you know, you're typically, if you go down to the sort of details of you know, stuff from other sellers kind of stuff, then a lot, of, a lot of the content from Amazon is coming from other people, not from Amazon itself. And that enables, and Amazon obviously takes its cut, but they provide the web service that enable people to sell through Amazon, which benefits the people as well. So you can like list items for sale. It's got this marketplace, web services, manage orders, generate reports, track shipments. 
never tried it myself, but I'm guessing there's a sort of uh, like a, a browser version, um, probably a programmatic API as well, but I'm, I'm, I'm looked into it in detail. There's the eBay API. Again, eBay's content is all user generated. They get their cut of the money on top of each sale that's made with eBay, and, but a lot of people direct their content through eBay and use that as their, their shop front. So you've got a bunch of uh, facilities that let people manipulate content on eBay using the API. Facebook Graph, it's a bit limited now, but it, it lets you, again, manipulate people's Facebook feeds. So this is particularly useful for companies, right? A lot of companies now um, have a sort of policy of you know, providing regular Facebook updates or whatever, and they can use the API to do that for them automatically. They can just publish. Uh, they probably have got systems where they publish a re press release or something, and then the Facebook graph will make that available on Facebook, and then there'll be a Twitter thing that releases on Twitter and so on and so forth. Okay, so I've tried in this lecture to give the bigger picture about the internet, the World Wide Web, commercial websites, and all the technologies that make that happen. And this has been a little bit of a conclusion in some ways um, to the sort of to the course. Um, if you're only doing uh, coursework one and coursework two, you know this will be the last lecture that you need to watch. If you're going to have a go at coursework three, which is based on JavaScript and Node, then the next couple of lectures are going to give you the technology that you need to do that.